All right, my name is Justin Fantaski. I'm gonna tell you about the modeling portion of our feedback project. We decided to model a hot air balloon. The balloon is modeled by an insulated box. This looks a lot like what we were working on in our homework. It has a heat input, an interior temperature that we called T1, and an ambient temperature called TA. That box is modeled by this impedance network, which results in a transfer function from heat input to interior temperature that we're going to call G1. The mass is going to be modeled as a simple mass with a buoyancy force. This mass is modeled by this impedance network, which yields this transfer function from force to position. We're going to call that transfer function G2. Um, the force is a function of the interior temperature of the balloon. We're going to talk about that in more detail later, but we made the assumption that the force is proportional to the interior temperature. And after linearization, when you take out a constant term here, force equals some constant times interior temperature. Um, this is a simplified block diagram. This also linearizes the um, not only the temperature model, but the force model. So we have our controller, C, which takes an input from the referent, from the reference position. That position is converted to a heat input by our controller. That heat input through G1 is converted to a temperature, that's the interior temperature of the balloon. That temperature is converted to a force through this constant, seen here, linearization. And that force through G2 is converted to a position. That position output is also the input to the feedback, the unity feedback. So after this analysis, we have our plant transfer function, the simplified version that's linearized as the constant for your force to temperature, your thermal resistance of the balloon over this term, which is the capacity or the capacitance, the thermal capacity of the balloon, and the mass of the balloon and basket. As you can see, the system is third order. The next step of our project is to analyze this system and meet our requirements. Okay. So before we could determine the relationship between the buoyancy force and the interior temperature of the balloon, we first had to linearize the relationship between the temperature and the density of air. Here we have uh, temperatures and air densities. By selecting a specific portion of temperatures, we can see a relatively linear trend between these temperatures and densities. So now that we have a relationship between the density of air and temperature, we can find the buoyancy force as a function of temperature. The buoyancy force is a function of the delta uh, density between the two mediums, the displaced volume and gravity. Uh, when we calculated the buoyancy force as a function of temperature, we had this constant term here. This term needs to be dropped so we can linearize the model. That results in a K value, which is essentially the transfer function from force or from temperature to force being 61.3125. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the design specifications for our project what they are, how we came about them, and how they're going to impact the outcome. So up here is the three specifications that we determined for our project. It is the overshoot, the rise time, and the steady state error. So the overshoot we specified to be less than 15%. The idea behind that is that being that it's a hot air balloon, we wanted to get to the level that we wanted to, and we're okay with it being 15% greater than that because it's not exactly a precise instrument, but we don't want it to go too far over as well. This is a good balance of controller cost and complexity. Second, the rise time is going to be greater than or equal to 100 seconds. That allows us to get to the level uh, 100 meter step that we want to within a reasonable or practical amount of time. We don't want it to be too fast to make it uncomfortable for the people or the equipment in the balloon, but we also don't want it to be so slow that it doesn't really get there practically. So 100 seconds is a good balance for that. Finally, the steady state error of less than 5% allows us to meet that height requirement and again, be within a reasonable amount of accuracy for a hot air balloon. 
So how do we turn these specifications into actual parameters for our controller? Well, we do it with the equations here listed on the board. So first off, we've got the overshoot specification uh, equation listed here. So we take our 15%, put that into the equation, and we solve for zeta, or the damping ratio. We get that the damping ratio has to be greater than or equal to 0 0.52. In a similar way, we do that with the time requirement, and here's the equation for that. So the rise time uh, greater than uh, 100 seconds is put into here, and we solve for our natural frequency, and we get that our natural frequency should be less than or equal to 0 0.022 radians per second. And then finally, the steady state error um, doesn't actually have an equation associated with it. What we do is we look at the system type as well as the type of input that's coming into it. So we have a step input coming into it. And if we look at the transfer function we have for our system, and it's listed up here on the board, we see that we have two integrators in that transfer function, which makes it a type two system. So just the fact that it is a type two system and it has a step input means that the steady state error will actually be zero. So that inherently meets this specification of less than 5% right off the bat. <clears throat> but as far as the other two goes, we can represent these graphically and see which region of the complex plane will allow us to meet these specifications. So, so now we're gonna discuss the social justice implications of the design specifications that we chose. Particularly, we want to focus on the rise time requirement of being greater than or equal to 100 seconds. So two factors are at play here when it comes to operating a balloon that have an impact on social justice. One of those is the way the balloon actually rises itself. Uh, it has a propane burner, and when you burn propane, it causes the balloon to rise. The more propane you burn, the faster you burn it, the quicker the balloon rises. Secondly, it has to do with the areas in which these balloons operate. Primarily, these balloons operate in rural areas over private land, uh, ranch land usually, so it's wide open, they have a lot of places to land. And a lot of times they'll encounter livestock on those, on those areas as well. So when these burners are burning, uh, they actually create a lot of noise, or they can create a lot of noise, and we, which can actually scare the livestock, and this is actually a problem for a lot of balloonists when it comes to operating their balloons over private land and with the ranchers and whatnot. So the slower they can burn their propane burners, the less noise it creates, and that creates less of an impact on the livestock and ultimately the ranch owners. So by creating a large rise time requirement, we can allow the propane burners to be used less and slower so that they are burning at a lower noise rate, create less noise pollution, and have a lower impact on the livestock. Hi, I'm Cody Young, and I'll be talking about the design and analysis that we used with Sisal Tool. Um, so this is our original plant transfer function that uh, we analyzed in Sisal Tool, and when we first put it in, our plant was unstable, and you can see this by the two loci that are going to infinity. Uh, we realized that we needed to add a zero to make our plant stable, and when we did this, it brought all the loci into the left-hand plane, which is the stable region. Um, we then used using Sisal Tool, put our design specifications um, within it, and that gives us our percent overshoot line. And if you zoomed in even closer, you could see the overshoot region that's not allowable, or the rise time that's not allowable. Um, we decided to put our zero where it is to meet our design specifications, and then adjusted our uh, pole values to give us uh, the gain and phase margin that we wanted. Um, our gain and phase margins can be calculated using the Bode plot uh, with SISO tool. And by default, our system had an infinite gain margin because our system, the phase graph, never crossed 180 degrees. Um, and then our phase margin was calculated because at our crossover frequency, uh, the phase is at 72 degrees. Um, so that gives us a 72 degree phase margin. Um, we adjust, we did all this through iteration. Um, this is just the finished product. Um, and by adding this zero, that by definition is a PD controller, so that allowed us to decide our controller uh, type. Um, and what we ended up with after everything was this is our controller that Sisal Tool gave us.
Hi guys, I'm Trey and I'm going to run you through the verification process we went through using Simulink. So as you can see here, we have on the top we have the block diagram of our original transfer function. And this just shows the transfer function we came up with. Um, and then the second one down shows the block diagram of our transfer function with the added controller. Now we should note here that we could not add a strictly PD controller because that would make a, an improper transfer function. So in order to deal with this setback, we had to incorporate our, our controller that Cody had established directly into our transfer function, as you can tell by the difference between the numerator of the second transfer function down. So using our step input of 100 meters um, and running through this block diagram, we achieved these results. And as you can see, um, our rise time and our percent overshoot specifications have been met with this added use of our controller, as well as our zero steady state error.